All right, everyone. Well, good morning. Today, I am hoping for us to work through a majority of the content in chapter five, looking at uh, the ideal gas equation, as well as non-ideal equations of state, um, with emphasis on using the compressibility factor and compressibility charts. So if we recall from last time, we had defined the ideal gas equation as PV equals NRT, where P stands for our absolute pressure. V is our volume. N is the number of moles. R is our ideal gas constant. And T is our absolute temperature. meaning we're gonna be looking at Kelvin or degrees Rankine. And so it's important to understand if we can assume that a gas behaves as an ideal gas, how this equation allows us to calculate process conditions so long as we know three of the four variables involved, meaning um, we're looking at this as a function of pressure, volume, moles, and temperature. Knowing three of the four allows us to calculate the fourth. And so I believe last time we ended on this quick example, looking at 150 grams of nitrogen stored in a container at 25 C and 2.1 atmosphere to estimate the container volume in liters. So we were looking for the volume. Rearranging this, we have P divided by NRT. So the pressure was 2.1 atmospheres. Oh, I should probably do that properly. Excuse me. The number of moles, well, we don't know the number of moles, but we know the mass. So 150 grams of N2, we divide by the molecular weight, or 28 grams per mole. That will give us the number of moles. R for this, I would use in terms of liter atmospheres, mole Kelvin, or 0 0.08205 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And the temperature was 20 degrees C or excuse me, 25 degrees C, which is 298 Kelvin. So if you run this calculation, you should get a volume of approximately 62 uh, liters. A couple other things that we can note is that of specific molar volume, which is denoted N over V, which tells us the number of moles of a species. per unit volume. And, and if we can assume an ideal gas holds, this specific molar volume, oh, did I do that wrong? Yeah, I did. Let me start over.
I calculated the inverse. It would be the volume of a species per unit mole. That makes way more sense. So by the ideal gas equation, calculating the specific molar volume tells us that, that value is a function of temperature and pressure. Meaning if we know the temperature and pressure of a gas, we know its specific molar volume. And it's also important to note this is independent of the species. For example, for an ideal gas, at zero degrees Celsius in one atmosphere, the specific polar volume is 22.1, excuse me, 0.4 liters per mole. Any questions on that so far? No? Okay, so we can keep moving. A couple important concepts are that of defining what's known as a standard temperature and pressure. And a standard temperature and pressure, or STP, allows the reporting of data relative to a specific temperature and pressure so that calculations can be done beyond that value. For gases, a typical STP value is when T is equal to zero degrees Celsius and when P is equal to one atmosphere. Thus, if I ask what's the specific molar volume at STP, you could quite easily state, well, the molar volume at STP should be 22.4 liters per mole. That's and as a quick example of this, if we had 200 cubic feet per minute, or CFM is what it's commonly denoted, of hydrogen flowing through a pipeline, How would the flow rate change and it's initially flowing at STP or standard temperature and pressure. So how would the flow rate change if the temperature were increased to 20 degrees Celsius. Well, from that problem, when te temperature is zero degrees C and pressure is one atmosphere, the volumetric flow rate of this gas is 200 cubic feet per minute. And if we assume an ideal, this is, behaves as an ideal gas, the ideal gas equation holds, or PV equals NRT. Or, since we're looking at flow rates, I can put it in terms of volumetric flow rate and a molar flow rate. Now, what I can do, since I'm interested in looking at the implication of changing the temperature, 
I can use a ratio or consider the implications of going from an initial state to a final state. Meaning if I write this expression, PV, P2, V2 equals N2, R2, T2, where T2 is 20 degrees Celsius, which is 293 Kelvin. And I have P1, V.1 is equal to N1, R1, T1, where T1 is zero degrees C, which is 273 Kelvin. And looking at the implications of going from zero degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius, if I assume that, well, I still have the same amount of gas, so my mole shouldn't change too much. The ideal gas constant is the ideal gas constant, so it shouldn't change much. And I'm going to assume the pressure isn't going to change, which may or may not be valid, but for the purposes of illustrating this process problem, I'm going to make that assumption. And what I can state is, well, based on what I can neglect, I can say, well, the ratio of molar flow rates should equal the ratio of the temperature implicate changes, which means my new volumetric flow rate over 200 cubic feet per minute should equal the ratio of the two temperatures, or 293 Kelvin over 273 Kelvin. This tells me that not only should my volumetric flow rate increase, but I can calculate by how much. So running this calculation, you should get about 214.7 cubic feet per minute. Are there any questions on that example? If not, let's look at another example. So if I have a process that takes air about 10 cubic feet of air at 70 degrees Celsius Fahrenheit and one atmosphere. And this process is going to compress this air and heat it to about 610 degrees Fahrenheit with a, now a new pressure of 2.5 atmospheres. And I can ask, based off this information, what's the final volume of this gas after it's been compressed? And how many pound moles of gas are in this process? Keeping in mind we have air, where the molecular weight is about 29 pounds per pound mole. Well, I can look at my ideal gas equation, PV equals nRT. And in order to determine the number of moles, I only need three of the four variables, which I have. I have pressure, volume, and temperature. So with that, I can solve for the number of moles. Or I can simply say PV over RT is equal to N. The tricky part comes in identifying what's uh, an appropriate R for this problem. 
primarily because I have volume in feet, cubic feet, and my temperature in Fahrenheit. Now, my in first instinct would be to use 10.73 cubic feet PSI per pound mole degree R. This tells me that I need to convert my pressures to PSI. So my pressure right now is at one atmosphere. And I know one atmosphere is approximately 14.7 PSI. The volume as provided is 10 cubic feet. The R that I'm using is 10.73 cubic feet PSI per pound mole degree Rankin, and my temperature is approximately 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 530 degrees Rankin. And I can quickly check my units and say, okay, the atmospheres cancel, the PSI cancels, the cubic feet cancels, and the degree Rankin cancels, and all I'm left with are my pound moles. So how many pound moles should this be? Running the calculation, I get about 0 0.026 pound moles or 0 0.0258. There. Now, knowing that I have 0 0.0258 pound moles of air, and I'm not, you know, doing any sort of crazy reactions, that tells me I should also have 0 0.0258 pound moles of air leaving my process. And now that I know the number of moles, I can now calculate the volume of that air leaving the compressor, because I have three out of the four variables. So using my same equation, PV equals NRT, I can solve for volume or NRT over P. So I get 0 0.0258 pound moles air times 10.73 cubic feet PSI over pound moles degree Rankin times the temperature, which is 610 degrees Fahrenheit or 1070 degree Rankin divided by the pressure, which was 2.5 atmospheres. And in one atmosphere, I have 14.7 PSI. Doing one more quick unit check. My atmospheres cancel, my PSI cancels, my pound moles cancel, and my degree Rankin cancels. And all I'm left with is cubic feet. So this states that my volume Let me just run that calculation really quick. I got 8.06. That's about what I had as well. 8.06 cubic feet. Which kind of makes sense if I'm telling you that it's going to be compressed. You would anticipate that the going to occupy a smaller volume. So... I have my new volume as well as the number of moles involved in my process. Are there any questions on that problem? All right, so 
So let's talk about some important implications of the ideal gas assumption, particularly when it comes in terms of ideal gas mixtures. So if I have a mixture of gases, I got some N2, O2, some argon, some helium, whatever, it's a party over here. Uh, where do you guys go? I got some methane. So if I have a mixture of gases, they're all occupying the same volume. They all have different number of moles. And if they're all mixed well and it's at equilibrium, they're all going to be at the same temperature. But the question is, what are the implications on pressure? Well, for each individual substance, since I can call them ideal gases, the ideal gas equation will hold for each species. And since they all occupy the same volume at the same temperature and have a specific number of moles, they'll each exhibit what's known as a partial pressure. Or I can state each species in the mixture their own partial pressure in the system. And this is denoted P sub I. Here, I'll clean this up. This is why I use something I can erase easily. And we can determine each species partial pressure by the system volume, the system temperature, and the number of moles of that species in the, in the system or in the container. And we can determine the total pressure of the system by summing the partial pressure of each species, or say the partial pressures We're simply stated, P is equal to the sum of I equal one to N of P sub I. Meaning, if I'm looking at the partial pressure of all my species to find the total pressure, I just add them up. And this is Dalton's law. If I could spell Dalton, it's with an O and with an A. I apologize for my handwriting. I'm sure it looks like chicken scratch. So let me ask you this then. If I have a mixture, right? The system has a specific volume. It's at a certain temperature. And each of these species have a given number of moles, right? I have N, N2, NCH4, N, O2 and argon. And now let's say I open the container and I quickly add some hydrogen in the system. So my question then goes, if I add hydrogen, Does this change the partial pressures of each species? So is the partial pressure of nitrogen, methane, oxygen, and argon going to change? What do you guys think? Yay, nay. I don't know, maybe. Yes. So I have a yes from Mitchie. What do you what do you think, Juliana, Eduardo, 
Phoebe, Taylor, Grace, Maddie, Cameron, Elizabeth. Got any votes? I say no because if each partial pressure exhibit their own, you know, partial pressure, then what you're adding shouldn't affect the other ones. Okay. I got a no. I got go one yes and one no. Somebody want to break a tie? I say yes. All right, I got two yeses and one no. I think yes, too. Okay. The answer is no. And for the reason that Eduardo stated, right? The partial pressure PV equals N sub IRT. These values aren't changing, even if I stuff it full of hydrogen. The volume of the system, the temperature of the system, and the number of moles of nitrogen, methane, oxygen, and argon isn't changing. So the partial pressure of each of these species is going to be independent of every other species in the system. What will change is the total pressure. Right, because I'm going to be adding more of a substance, and so that substance is going to start exhibiting its own partial pressure. So the total pressure of the system is going to increase, but the partial pressures of each species is still going to be the same because it's independent of each other. And that's an important thing to kind of understand in terms of the implications of ideal gas mixtures and Dalton's law. It's these the the ideal gases they're ideal because they act independent of one another. Does that make sense? I'm gonna take by your stunned silence that it does. However, one thing we can note is that since I'm looking at pressure as a sum of number of moles and the partial pressures, and I can state that the sum or how it's the best way to say this, the mole fraction of a substance is known as the Mole, amount of moles of a substance divided by the sum of the moles. I can then combine these two equations and state that the partial pressure of a species is the total pressure times the mole fraction of that species. You guys kind of see where that comes from. And this is an important implication when looking at mixtures of ideal gases. And the last thing to consider when looking at ideal gases is if I'm looking at a particular substance, P sub I equals V times B, not divided by, times B equals N sub I R T. And 
And I divide this by the total in the system. And I cancel what's constant. I'm left with a simple expression that states P sub I over P equals N sub I. Oof. I think I did that wrong. Yeah, I wanted to look at pressure implications. Let me try this again. So instead of looking at partial pressures, I'm going to look at component volumes. And if I divide this system over the total, the species over the total, I'm left with something that looks like this. where the number of moles of a species over the total of number of moles is just the mole fraction of that species. So what this is implying is that the mole fraction equals the volume fraction for an ideal gas. Also for an ideal gas, if it's something is stated in terms of mole percent, that also means it's the volume percent. For species at a known pressure and temperature. And so there's, it's, it's a little weird um, but you can think of things in terms of the partial pressure and also for ideal gases in terms of volume fractions and volume percents. And, and noting that um, for ideal gases, mole fraction and volume fraction or mole percent and volume percent are analogous. So let's look at a quick example before we move on to non-ideal equations of state. So if I have a tank that has a mixture of gases and the tank pressure is at 10 bar, the temperature is approximately 200 degrees C the volume of the tank is 100 cubic meters. And in this tank, I have 50 volume percent hydrogen, 25 volume percent nitrogen, and 25 volume percent argon. What are the partial pressures of each component? Well, I stated earlier that volume percent and mole percent are analogous. So if I have 50 per volume percent hydrogen, that tells me that my mole fraction of hydrogen is 0.5. My mole fraction of nitrogen is 0.25 and the mole fraction argon is also 0.25. And as I stated earlier, I can determine the partial pressures from these small fractions by Dalton's law, where P sub I equals P times Y sub I. 
So the partial pressure of hydrogen is simply the total pressure, 10 bar times 0.5 or five bar. And the partial pressure of nitrogen is equal to the partial pressure of argon, which is 0.25 times 10 bar or 2.5 bar. The next thing it asks in this example is what is the volume fraction excuse me the pure component volume of argon Now, as I stated earlier, this partial volume is also equal to that volume fraction. And cutting that partial component for argon over the 100 cubic meters equals its mole fraction, which is 0.25, which means the argon volume is 25 cubic meters. And lastly, if in this system, right, we have hydrogen, nitrogen, argon, I said the volume is 100 cubic meters, pressure was 10 bar, the temperature, I don't know if I stated the temperature, 200 degrees Celsius. What would happen to the temp to the partial pressure of nitrogen if the temperature if I could write increased to two twenty five? So what do you think would happen to the partial pressure of nitrogen in this system if we increased the temperature to 225 degrees Celsius from its original state of 200 degrees Celsius? Do you guys think the partial pressure would increase, decrease, or stay the same? What do you guys think? It would, it would decrease. So I got one for decrease. Would it stay the same? I got one for stay the same. Any other voters? Thank you. What'd you say, Juliana? Stay the same. I got two votes for stay the same. Any other voters? Well, let's take a look. All right, PV equals NRT. Looking at the partial pressure. But now I can compare this stuff in terms of a T2 and a T1. So the ideal gas constant shouldn't change. 
the volume in the system isn't really going to change. And the number of moles in the system isn't going to change either. So I'm looking at a comparison between the partial pressure and the temperature. So by looking at this relation, I have PI2 over PI1 equals T2 over T1, which I have, what, 200 degrees and 225. 200 degrees is 473 Kelvin. 225 is 498 Kelvin. So if the temperature is going to increase, as the other variables are constant, the partial pressure should increase as well. Right, and so the partial pressure of each component in the system will increase. And the total pressure in the system will increase as well. So, so the partial pressure increased from 2.5 to 2.63 bar. So the answer is increase. Do you guys see why? That's why it's important when you're looking at certain things, like on a quiz, hint, hint, to, to look at the equation and ask yourself, based on what's being asked, how are these variables going to change? The ideal gas equation is going to hold. So if you change one side of the equation, you have to consider the implications for the other side of the expression. Are any questions on implications of the ideal gas equation? Why were you not worried about the moles for that problem? For this problem? Well, the number of moles isn't in the box isn't going to change if you heat the box. Does that make sense? Okay. So the number of moles isn't going to change. The ideal gas constant is just that, a constant, and I'm not changing the size of the box. So I'm just looking at, okay, the implications of partial pressure on temperature. All right, let's switch gears then and start under discussing the implications for non-ideal gases slash equations of state. And so everybody loves an assuming ideal gas equation holds and an ideal gas is valid. However, for a lot of gases at certain temperatures and pressures, um, molecular interactions start to occur and collisions start being, you know, not perfectly inelastic. And so a lot of non-idealities in the system start occurring which have to be taken into consideration. And the propensity of those non-ideal interactions um, can be strongly correlated with a substance's critical temperature and pressure. So let's a look take a look at defining a critical temperature and pressure. So if I have a temperature here on the x-axis, pressure here on the y-axis, systems that are at low 
temperature and low pressure typically behave as a vapor. And at extremely low temperatures, and reasonable pressures, we're gonna have kind of a curve here. We're gonna be looking at things that are considered solid. But we're not gonna worry too much about those. But eventually, at reasonable pressures and temperatures, we also get a second curve, which delineates the difference between a vapor and a liquid. And as well as we can have a curve here that kind of delineates, and I know this isn't very well a scale, a liquid and a solid. So we have a liquid phase, a solid phase, and a vapor phase. Now, beyond at a certain temperature and pressure, we get what's known as the critical point. And this critical point occurs at the critical temperature and the critical pressure, where if you have a substance beyond this critical point, it behaves in terms of what's known as a supercritical fluid. And I'm trying to move through this really quickly, but the implication is, is as you get closer and closer to supercritical fluid behavior, a lot of the ideal gas assumptions and behavior starts to break down. And so a lot of the non-ideal equations of state consider as the system temperature as a relation to the critical or a temperature ratio, as well as the system pressure in relation to the critical pressure or this pressure ratio. And so how close that is to unity really determines in a lot of systems whether the ideal gas assumption is valid or not, and if not, whether other equations of state have to be considered. Now, there are a significantly numerous number of non-ideal equations of state. I don't wanna have to go into them too much, but the important thing to understand is for these functions is that I'm gonna call them NIEOS. They're novel methods of describing a function's pressure, volume, and temperature together. And even if I, if I draw it like that, you'll see why. Where if I define V dot as um, V over N, right? That specific molar volume, right? So if I can relate all these variables as a function, I can use either the ideal gas or the non-ideal equations of state. Where if we're gonna look at, let's say the ideal gas equation, right, which is essentially PV equals NRT, or simply if I look at it in terms of specific volume, PV dot equals RT, and if I look at this ratio, PV dot RT equals one. Meaning, if I, the ideal gas equation holds, the ratio of specific molar volume times temp pressure divided by the ideal gas constant times temperature should be unity. And for non-ideal equations of state, this function, PV equals NRT, doesn't equal one. And so that means is what additional terms or correction factors must be considered 
to describe the gas's behavior. Does that make sense? Just as a quick recap. So for non-ideal gas equations to state, the critical temperature and pressure become important because this, the actual gases temperature and pressure re, as related to those two point values tells you how close you are to approaching non-ideal behavior. And when we look at comparing non-ideal behavior to ideal behavior, I can consider based on the ideal gas equation that if everything's ideal, this ratio should be unity. And if not ideal behavior isn't valid, I have to ask myself, since it's not unity, what additional terms or correction factors are necessary? Meaning, is it gonna be one plus something? Is it gonna be one times something? Right, so I'm gonna be looking for additional terms, fudge factors to correct my behavior, to fully describe it, and to minimize the error in my calculations. Now there's a lot of ways it can be done. It really depends on the actual species as well as on its temperature and pressure. One way of looking at it is through the virial equation of state. And what the virial equation of state does is since this value isn't unity, it asks itself, well, are there additional terms that I can have to fully describe the behavior, All right? So instead of unity, it's, it's one plus a correction factor, which can be determined empirically, right? So these, this B, C, and D are empirical constants. you know, just for implications, the V dot or V hat is a specific molar volume. And a lot of times you can get away with just truncating it. So we just call it the truncated virial equation of state where you really just consider that first term after the unity. Right, because theoretically, as these terms and values are developed, you know, you, you get greater accuracy by looking at the C and the D variables and constants in those terms. But the question is, you know, does adding this one term, does it make it accurate enough for a majority of calculations? So let's look at a quick example. So I've got three grams of nitrogen in a three liter tank and the tank is at negative 150.8 degrees Celsius. So if I were to estimate the pressure using an ideal gas equation, I can calculate it, right? PV equals NRT. So NRT over V should equal P, right? So I have three grams over 28 grams per mole. Ideal gas constant is, let's see, 0 0.08205 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Temperature is negative 150.8. which tells me my temperature is 122 Kelvin. 
and the volume is three liters. So if I use the ideal gas equation, I get a pressure fairly low, about 0.358 atmospheres. But now let's compare it to using the varial equation. Well, for the varial equation, since P V dot over R T is equal to one plus B over V dot, P varial equals R T over V hat plus BRT over V hat squared. Does everyone see where I got that? Where for nitrogen, B is going to equal about negative 0 0.113 liters per mole. And I'm, for the sake of time, skipping how we can find B. It's typical, like I said, it's a function of the critical temperature and the critical pressure. So the variable equation pressure going to equal to 0 0.08205 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin times temperature, which I had earlier as, what was it, 122 Kelvin. It, is your temperature 150? It's negative 150.8. Oh, negative 150.8. Yes, you're fine. The volume what did I have for the volume? Three liters. So it'd be three liters divided by the number of moles, which is um, how many grams? I had three grams, three over 28. So this is liters per mole. Plus this B value, negative 0 0.113 liters per mole times 122 Kelvin divided by this value that I had here, three divided by three divided by 28 liters per mole squared. So doing this calculation, I have 0.357, right? Or it's actually 0.358, I need to round. Plus the correcting term of negative 0 0.113 times 122. Divided by 28 squared. So plus a negative 0 0.018 atmospheres, right? So what this tells me is this was my pressure ideal. And this is my correction for the non-ideal behavior. So the virial equation gives me a pressure of about 0 0.34 atmospheres. 
So that tells me that I would overestimate the pressure using the ideal gas equation. Any questions on that? All right. Now there's a couple other non-ideal equations of state that we can talk about. I'm gonna kind of just introduce them and not go too much into them because I wanna talk a little bit about uh, compressibility and the compressibility factor. But one of them is the van der Waals equation of state. which it's, it's one of what's called the cubic equation of state. It just means there's three terms that are solved. But this equation of state looks a little like this. Where you have two correction terms, one here and one here. which correct for the non-ideal behavior. And you'll see that kind of as a theme, is you, a lot of these equations of state were derived by starting with the ideal gas equation and then coming up with empirical relationships to correct the ideal gas equation for observed non-ideal behavior. Another type that looks really similar is so red like Kwong. Which we simply call SRK. And it's similar to the Van der Waals in terms of its approach. However, they've tweaked this second term to improve its accuracy. Like I said, these A and Bs are constants. They're calculated. So it's a lot of it, it's just calculations, lots of plug and chug using empirical constants, calculating these values as a function of the critical temperature and pressure. But let's take a little time looking at, known as the compressibility factor. which I think is, especially once you put in times of getting your feet wet with non-ideal equations of state, it's the most approachable because it simply states that since we know this ratio isn't equal to one, we can ask ourselves if it's not equal to one. Oh, I think my thing started crashing. probably overheating. Let me get you back. No, oh, that does not look good. Since our ratio P, V hat over RT is not equal to one. Well, I can say instead of it's not equal to one, it's equal to some other value Z, where Z is our compressibility factor. Okay. 
where when z equals one, we can assume it's an ideal gas. And when it's not equal to one, well, we have a non-ideal gas on our hands. And so the compressibility equation of state is simply PV equals a Z and RT. And so you can see why it's kind of a lot easier in terms of getting your feet wet with non-ideal gas equations of state. Because it's simply a fudge factor for the ideal gas equation. So there's a lot of ways in which it can be calculated. But one of the most handy ways in which it's done is through what's known as a compressibility chart. And the way the compressibility charts work is here, and the best way to tell you is to kind of show you. Here, and I'll just kind of, in this chart, which they're all in the book, you see that on the x-axis is what's known as a reduced pressure. On the y-axis, we have our correction factor, or our z-factor. And we have a bunch of curves at various T sub R factors or reduced temperatures, where the reduced pressure is simply a ratio of the system pressure over its critical, uh, the critical pressure. And the reduced temperature is the species temperature over the critical temperature of that species. And so in order to use the compressibility charts. You simply have to calculate T sub R and P sub R, where T sub R is equal to T over TC, P sub R is equal to P over PC. Find the intersection of PR and TR on the chart, and then move along the X direction to the Y axis. And read off your compressibility factor. Now there are some corrections for hydrogen and helium on the critical factors. So just bear that in mind if you're using the, the charts for hydrogen and helium, you're going to have to make some adjustments. You'll have to refer to the book for those values. Um, it's about 8K for your critical temperature and eight atmospheres for your critical pressure. But other than that, it's, it's as straightforward as that. So let's look at one last example to wrap up for the day in terms of using the compressibility chart. So if I have 50 moles of nitrogen now, in a vessel where the volume is five liters and the temperature is negative 20 degrees Celsius. Can we estimate the pressure using the compressibility charts? So I can say estimate P using compressibility charts, or I can also state it as just the compressibility. Oh, my handwriting's terrible on this tablet. The 
equation of state. So I know PV equals Z and RT. My number of moles is 50 moles. My temperature is already stated, negative 20 degrees C, which is 250 to 3 Kelvin. My R, I'm going to be using the 0 0.08205 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And I don't have, I do have V, but I don't have Z or P. It's five liters. So in order to figure this out, I need to know, well, what's the critical temperature and critical pressure of nitrogen? Well, these are things that you have to do some looking up. If it's on like an, a, a, an, a, an exam, um, I'll probably give them to you. Or if I don't, just ask me and say, hey, I'm because I'm not expecting you to be able to look those kinds of things up on an exam. For a homework, I could probably make you look it up because they're pretty easy to find. So I have 126.2 Kelvin and 33.5 atmospheres for the critical pressure. So for my ratio, T over T sub C, I have 120. Excuse me, 253 Kelvin over 126.2 Kelvin. Which is about two. And for my pr reduced pressure, P over P sub C. I don't know it, right? Because I'm looking for the pressure, right? So this is where it gets a little tricky. So what do you think we should do? There's a couple things you can do. One, I would argue, is more accurate than another. What you can do is you can estimate the pressure using the ideal gas equation, plug that in, and run the calculations and check your value, and it ends up being kind of an iterative process. There's another workaround that you can do on some compressibility charts, not all, but there's a value known as a reduced pressure that can appear as an additional variable, which is a function of the critical temperature, pressure, and specific molar volume, where you can look at the intersection between this reduced pressure volume and the reduced temperature in place of the reduced pressure to find your Z value. So for example, for this, we would look at 33.5 atmospheres times V hat or V over N, which is five liters over 50 moles, divided by the ideal gas constant, 0 0.08205 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin, and the critical temperature, 126.2. This gives us a reduced volume of approximately, let me run the calculation, 
0.323. So I have a reduced volume and a reduced temperature. And looking on the compressibility charts, which it gets really difficult to see. That's why there's multiple charts. We get a Z of about 1.2. And so this gives us our correction factor for our P. So then we can recalculate PV equals Z and RT. Or P is equal to Z and RT over V which is equal to 1.2 times our 50 moles times our ideal gas constant, 0.08205 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Our temperature, which was 253 Kelvin, and our volume, which was 5 liters. So you get about 248 atmospheres. So without looking at the Z, it would have been off by about 20%. And so using this allows you to find simple correction factors for the ideal gas equation. Now, keeping uh, in mind that there aren't some very good explicit expressions for Z, um, most often they're not, they're obtained from these compressibility charts. And admittedly, the compressibility charts are quite difficult to read. And so, because of this, the accuracy of this method is, is fairly limited. So more often times than not, other equations of state are going to be used, but for the purposes of getting you guys comfortable using these non-ideal functions, um, the Z factor is a good place to start. So are there any questions on today's lecture? I know I kind of ran through chapter five fairly quickly, but hopefully with this lecture, practicing using the homework, feel free to reach out to me with questions. I know I've had a little trouble. I've, I've had quite a few people trying to reach out like right when the homework's due. So I, I really encourage you guys to, to kind of start early when you can and send me those emails um, before, you know, the deadline kind of looms so that I have time to respond and you have time to digest what I, what I say. But um, hopefully things are going well for you guys. And I guess, are there any questions? Are you going to um, send out more information about the test tomorrow? Uh, yeah, I'll send a reminding email later, um, probably this afternoon. Um, I need to release the homeworks, which I'll, uh, the keys, which I'll probably do right after this class. But um, in terms of the midterm, I'm going to just, it's going to be on Blackboard. I'm going to release it on Blackboard at 11. Um, 
and I'll be on Zoom for the during the duration. I'll send out that Zoom link. It'll probably just be the lecture link. And you'll have to turn it in on Blackboard uh, by the deadline. So you guys are have from 11 to 3, which is about four hours. I don't recommend you, uh, I guess if you, if you want to need the time, you could take off four hours, but it's really there for you guys to work a little bit, take like a five minute break, breathe, try it again, take a break, get a sandwich kind of thing. Because I'm, I'm hoping it shouldn't, it shouldn't take you more than about an hour, hour and a half tops to get through it. But you now mileage varies with each user. So are there any other questions? Is the test just mainly on chapter four or is this chapter five stuff? It's going to be chapter four. Okay. I don't feel comfortable testing over chapter five. I think that would be a little, um, I don't want to say unfair, but unreasonable. Okay. Just because I think chapter four is, is essentially half of this class. Five and six, while well, covering a lot of topics, they're not the like meat of uh, the material. It's, you know, chapter four is like material balances, five and six is how do I deal with equilibrium and breakdowns between liquids and vapors to finish material balances. Are you gonna have office hours today? Yeah, I'll try to have office hours from two to four today. Okay. Yep. And will there be a lecture tomorrow? Uh, no, there will be no lecture tomorrow. It will simply be for the midterm. So we'll Thank start you. on chapter six on Friday. Yeah, that seemed a little crazy. All right, anything else? And like I said, I think I did, I pushed back, I think this ho next last homework, what did I push back? I think it was the homework. So it'll be due Friday along with, um, no, it was the quiz I pushed back to Friday. So it'll be due with the homework because the quiz was over chapter five stuff and I didn't really talk about it until this morning. So the quiz will be due Friday and the homework will be due Friday. So like I said, I know it, it kind of stinks because it's condensed, but there's really no way around me doing some of this because we have a month to get through what we need to, to discuss. Any last minute questions? All right, if not, take care guys. Uh, have a great rest of your day. And as always, uh, feel free to reach out. Bye.